It's the Accounting Influencers Podcast, one of the leading shows in the world for CPAs, professionals, bookkeepers, finance people all over, where we bring you the best experts to share with you what's really happening in the accounting and finance world. We have back with us today for the second time, Jennifer Kreider. I'll say that again and we'll edit that bit. We have on with us the show today, Jennifer Kreider. She is back for the second time. She's the CEO of the Pennsylvania Institute of Certified Public Accountants in the US. It's a very influential professional body, punches above its weight, as we found last time in the whole CPA space in the US. Jen, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Rob. Jen, we spoke last time about the accounting profession generally. Does it have an image problem? Is the CPA qualification fit for purpose? What are the key challenges, particularly facing somebody like you that wields a lot of influence in the professional is driving change? What do you feel is the key challenge for the profession right now? Um, the profession is facing a lot of challenges around transforming itself. Um, I think what the profession was for the last 125, 150 years uh, has changed dramatically. And so the, the profession is almost going through this sort of existential period of, of what are we going to be next? And I think, as we talked about before, there's immense opportunity in that because the profession is redefining itself based on those core fundamental elements of, of trust and public protection. What are the key drivers of the changes that you're talking about? I agree with you. There's never been more change than there is right now. And we're emerging from the pandemic. So that changed the game. But there are some key drivers of change here that are forcing the profession to look at itself and people like you or that oversee it to look at it and saying, where are we going? Yeah, absolutely. There's a couple of key drivers. I think that um, human capital challenges are a big driver today. Uh, acutely, the profession is feeling that pressure. But if you step outside of that, I think the business model of accounting firms is changing drastically. That's driven a lot by the investment that's required, um, both in human capital and technology. As we look at technology's impact on the profession, it's um, it's an expensive investment to make, but transforming the way that CPAs do their work. Um, outside of human capital, business model, technology, I think that the services and the needs that the, that the capital markets and even Main Street businesses have of CPAs are also changing drastically, right? What our clients need from us um, is wildly different than it was before. We talked a lot about your role in the last show and how important it is that you unite with your peers to shape the profession not just in your own little pockets, but as a united force. But you particularly, Jen, we noticed you have a, a strong public profile. You put yourself out there on social. You make other people aware of you. You're a great ambassador for the profession. Talk to us about your personal brand and how intentional you are with sticking your head up there and, and being controversial and candid in your views. <laughs> I think, Rob, that that really just comes from my personal experience as a CPA being in practice for 15 years. Um, I you say that, but I know a lot of CPAs that stay under the radar. <laughs> that's true. That's true. I just like so many other things in this role, I never imagined that I would be here. I um, just loved being an auditor in public accounting for most of my career, but I can't help but leverage the, the role that I have right now. And uh, it's such a privilege to have this role. I have to leverage it for the benefit of the profession. The profession has given me so much um, and transformed my life personally in a way that I never could have imagined. And so I don't want to waste this opportunity that I have. Um, so we have intentionally made this um, a part of my role at PICPA because I think that this organization can make a big impact on the profession. And I want to use, I want to use whatever tools are at my disposal to do that uh, because mm. I care a lot about the work that CPAs do. Yeah. And there's many ways to establish influence and wield it. And do you see sometimes that people that should be more advocates and proponents for what is going on, kind of holding back and staying behind the scenes a little bit? Do you despair that we all should be out there shouting from the rooftops that this is a great profession to be in? There are so many wonderful opportunities. I think that we all should tell that story more than we do, uh, right. because I think hearing those firsthand experiences are the biggest way to change the image of the profession. I can't change the image of the profession single-handedly. I need every CPA in Pennsylvania and every CPA across the country, frankly, um, yeah. to change that image. But 
The other thing I'll say to your point, just because somebody is not out there publicly um, kind of advocating and pushing, just like anything else, it doesn't mean that they're not working diligently behind the scenes. I do see nationally a lot of folks taking that, you know, quiet influencer role behind the scenes. Um, I just feel like I have a mix of personal experiences that that lend themselves to championing some of these issues. And so I'm happy to do that. Yeah, that's a fair point. I accept that. We're going to deep dive in this show about talent and about business firm models, two prickly issues. We know the CPA profession is faced with a number of talent pipeline issues and the workforce shortage. We've got quiet quitting and the great resignation and accounting and finance has been hit as hard as anybody. So uh, tell us about some of the major focuses as you work to address these challenges, Jen. Yeah, I think the first thing to point out is that uh, pipeline is a is a part of the conversation, but when I look at it, I look at a long-term human capital strategy because when I think about where are we trying to get to, where we're trying to get to is the supply of talent matching kind of the demands of the marketplace and those things being in equilibrium. So definitely we know that demographics are such, the generations coming in will not replace CPAs at a rate of one-to-one as they retire. Uh, and that's across the U.S., certainly more acute in the in the part of the U.S. that Pennsylvania is. Um, so we know the pie is shrinking. We know that less people are choosing to go to college and choose accounting as a major. Um, and so you put all of these factors together, and I think we have to look at kind of the whole continuum. Um, where Where we stand today is the result of a lot of complex factors. There's not one silver bullet that solves the problem. Um, And so we have to look at that whole ecosystem and we can talk more about what I think all of those pieces are, but I always wanna start the conversation about pipeline with that kind of thought process, because if you don't, I think you run the risk of solving the wrong problem, if that makes Mm. sense. Yeah, it's really good context. Thank you for that. And. The accounting finance world is not alone in facing talent shortages and at all levels. For instance, we know the baby boomer generation are controlling public accounting firms. They are the senior partners, the managing partners, the leaders, the equity partners, and they'll be moving on in the next 5, 10, 15 years. And is that younger generation coming through interested in an equity partner model? We could talk about that. But What responsibility do you feel the older generation, the guardians, if you like, of public accounting, what role do they have in easing this situation we're in with talent? Yeah, I think you're hitting on a really great point right there, Rob. So uh, that generation has a couple of responsibilities or a couple of decision points that I think will chart the course for their firm into the future, right? So number one is what's the type of firm culture that you're going to build? And that gets to issues of work-life balance and um, certainly retention of talent, because we're, we're spending so much time talking about getting talent into the pipeline. Firm leaders have an immense responsibility once we get them in to make sure they stay. So that's one whole area of responsibility. Um, Another area of responsibility is around investment in technology. So in many cases, these firm partners who are a couple of years from retirement are facing massive price tags to invest in the kind of technology that's gonna transform the work their firm does in the near future. That hits their pension pot though, Jen, doesn't it? (laughs) It does, it really does. So the trade-off is if you don't make the investment now, the firm's not gonna be future ready. But these leaders of the firms are likely not going to be around to see the benefit of it. So they're going to bear the cost without seeing the return. Mm. And so one of the reasons that the partnership model, in my opinion, is under immense pressure and stress is because that choice, uh, it's just so at odds. Um, So there's, there's some really big decisions around investment in technology. When you put those two things together, the human capital and the culture investments and the technology investments, it becomes really hard for firms to compete in that kind of middle tier or small firms. The cost of investment in human capital and technology, in my opinion, is what's driving a lot of the M&A activity that we've seen in the last couple of years because some leaders of firms are just looking at it and saying, instead of making those investments, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take the third option and join either join forces with another firm or merge up or whatever those options are. There's a lot of different models emerging there. Let's camp on the M&A for a moment. We saw with the BKD-GHD merger, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, we interviewed Matt Snow, chairman of Forvis now, the new company. That nobody's too big to merge now. It can happen to anybody and everybody, can't it? It's true. That one was so interesting to see two large equal firms coming together. Um, and, you know, they've got a footprint here in this part of the U.S. And um, it, it, it'll be really interesting to see. We've, we've got a large group of firms racing toward, you know, being billion dollar firms. Uh, and again, that for me goes back to just the massive investment in people and technology. It, it's very hard to compete uh, when you're not at that scale. I, I think what I see uh, here in Pennsylvania and across the country, each individual local market, each little town or geography has certainly got room for some compliance focused firms where, you know, it's just your local CPA, they've got the relationships, they're on the, the board of the local charity, those sorts of things. Um, but I don't know that these local markets have room for as many compliance firms as used to exist. So you see that real differentiation between that high touch, high relationship compliance firm or the professional services firm that's got a wide range of offerings um, that is gonna try to meet a client's needs all across the board, um, but maybe has less tie to the local geography. Mm. You and I were talking off air about a talk that Mark Coziel did, he's well known to the CPA world and uh, obviously head of a lineal global, he was in London at a conference I chaired called the International Accounting Forum and spoke about the partnership model and how it's dead. And the C-suite model is coming in and private equity venture capital money is driving that, of course, but that it's not fit for purpose, that partners cannot be managed. So what does a managing partner actually do? And there's so many vested interests and private agendas and inner machinations and intransigence and inertia with the partner model. I don't know if you'd go that far, but if it isn't working currently or it's under pressure, as you're saying, what are the alternatives? Yeah, it's a great question, Rob. I do see often when I'm talking to to firm leadership teams, I do see uh, the ones that are able to succeed and transform are the ones that have a partnership group that's really aligned on that vision. So I really think there's something to that point. Um, A lot of options are emerging right now that are not that traditional pyramid structure. So even if a firm wanted to pursue that traditional partnership pyramid structure, um, offshoring, outsourcing, and technology have totally changed the base of that pyramid. So as a profession, I think we have to solve for having far less entry-level talent um, because of those things that I just named. But if a firm doesn't want to stick with that pyramid model, uh, there's a lot of professionalization happening. So certainly, like you alluded to, more professional management, uh, CEOs and chief operating officers that run the business day to day that don't have that client service uh, workload. I think that's really positive for firms because I hear all the time, um, you know, yeah, we're, we're out there advising our clients, but we're not taking care of our own business. Um, and so I think having those professionalized roles offers a firm, even if they stick with a more traditional model, some tools to stay competitive and, and rethink. Outside of that, though, um, definitely we've seen private equity. Um, recently, we saw wealth management come in and buy a firm. All of those alternate practice structures are very interesting because they're separating essentially the attest work from the advisory work um, and really rethinking the model. Um, what I think is interesting in that separating the attest and advisory as it relates to human capital is that it allows those firms, at least within the advisory practice, to incentivize high potential talent much earlier in the career. They don't have to wait until they make partner. Um, I'm hearing with, with private equity and some of these alternate practice structures, um, the firms are able to give what would be equivalent to a stock option much earlier in the career. Um, I think that's really interesting. And I think as a profession, we should think about how we do more of those sorts of innovative things, right? We're giving our clients all of these advice. How do we, how do we apply that to ourselves? Because I saw this in my own career. If you're a high potential manager in an accounting firm, you're working with lots of clients and all of those clients have a CFO role opening up at some point. You may look at that and say, well, geez, that CFO role is a higher salary. I get stock options. So if I grow the value of the company, I get exponentially rewarded there. Um, and that manager may make some assumptions about work-life balance fairly or unfairly in making a jump to a CFO. What I think 
this stock option concept and this alternate practice structure concept does is really allows um, firms to compete on some of those points where they mm. necessarily couldn't before. And private equity, venture capital, that external money, what are they seeing in accounting firms that is making them so attractive? Because we know they're out to make money. And depending on your answer, are we going to see more of it in the future or have we leveled out with it? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I think what they're seeing uh, is... It's my job to ask great questions, by the way. That's the whole point of a podcast. That's why we get on experts like you that have all the answers. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I don't, know that, I don't know about having all of the answers, but right. my take on the private equity issue is that they're seeing really well-run businesses that have strong cash flow, low debt, um, you the know... revenues. Yeah, yeah. It, it's no secret that the last three years, accounting firms have been more profitable than ever. Um, and so I think private equity is seeing that and, and seeing how there's definitely redundancy among accounting firms in that back office stuff. When you think about professionalizing it, they see some impact they can make there. Um, so you, you put all those pieces together and it's not a surprise. The interesting thing will be to see where it goes, right? Now that the first round of private equity has bought in, and I know these models existed before, um, but now that this first round is in, like what is that exit strategy and how does it play out over the next couple of years? Mm -hmm. uh, I do think we could see more of this for sure, because I think, like I've said a few times, there's never been more opportunity in our profession. And it's no surprise to me that, that an industry like private equity would notice that opportunity and capitalize on it. You do wonder what that exit will be, though, because if they sell out at what they feel is the premium time and take their pocket of money with them, who is going to come in to take on that deal? Mm -hmm. Because if it's yeah. been, if it's been, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? If it's been maxed out, then where's the where's the margins in it? Right, right. And and the thing that I think about in my role as a state society is the regulation of that. Okay. So uh, our profession historically was led and owned by CPAs. At this point, I would say that we are still led by CPAs, but even that, that leadership and that ownership is getting quite diluted. So where does the profession go as that dilution continues where, you know, maybe you have an attest entity and that's still owned by CPAs because by law that has to happen and that's the regulatory environment. But if all of the growth and profitability and revenue is in um, the advisory side, that is not majority owned by CPAs, how does the regulation and the standard setting and, and all of that keep up with that structure? You are so in the right job, Jen, having these conversations and wading through complexities like this. A conversation that I'm having more and more these days on our show is the role of non-credentialed people. So if you think about the talent problem, getting qualified CPAs and accounting graduates into a public firm is harder and harder. So they're looking at people that are accredited in certain softwares or people that have a, a skill set that is valuable to the firm, but they're not CPAs. You talked about firms being owner-led. Uh, sorry, CPA owned and CPA led. But what about the, the marketing manager? And what about the business development director? And what about the head of HR? And those people that are not CPA qualified, but they're more and more appearing in the boardrooms and making strategic decisions on where the firm's going. Can you talk about that for a little bit? Absolutely. I think that that factor will emerge to, to reshape the firms as they move toward more professional uh, leadership and management, but the factor I think that you that you didn't address there that's equally as important is firms are hiring record numbers of non CPAs, right. and I think that that's because of two reasons. I think clients are demanding more complicated work from their CPA, and so having a, a mix of skill sets on an audit or a tax engagement team uh, helps meet the needs of the clients better. Right. Um, but also, if a firm is going to a business school to hire and they can't find enough accounting graduates, um, it's no surprise that they would start looking at other majors to fill out um, their engagement teams. So the data has shown that over the last couple of years, firms at the entry level have hired record numbers of non-accounting graduates. Um, and so I think that's going to have an 
even a bigger impact because the firms can't get the accounting grads they need and the clients are demanding different skill sets. So having technology people or computer science people or math backgrounds or even law backgrounds become really um, a competitive advantage to an accounting firm. What's your take, Jen, on the role of outsourcing and offshoring as a way to tap into human capital? We know that these companies have sprung up sourcing talent from all over the world where there is abundance of skilled people and accounting qualified professionals. Mm -hmm. Uh, So two thoughts I'll share on that. The first is that it it sounds like the model has matured considerably over the last decade. Originally, that was, as you know, something that only the the largest global firms would take advantage of. Here in Pennsylvania, I'm hearing of very, you know, comparably small regional accounting firms taking advantage of this um, because the market has matured so far uh, that not only can they access those pools of talent, but Uh, they're able to, within their firm, sort of figure out the business processes to take advantage of it. So not only at the entry level sort of data entry points, but um, I'm hearing regional firms here in Pennsylvania that are are offshoring the preparation of a tax return and it's just coming back for review and things like that. Um, You know, when I talk to firms, I say it's it's one arrow in the quiver. It is not for everyone. Um, I think that What's so interesting to me in my role is that firms choose to solve these strategic business model problems different ways. So some firms really double down on offshoring and outsourcing and they build their processes around that. Some focus on leveraging technology, some on human capital, and and they're like levers that that a firm can pull in different combinations. So um, I don't think it's the be all end all for everybody, but I do think it's an important lever. And if I was a firm leader, I want to understand each of them and the impact that they could make. Um, and I do think that we'll just continue to see that grow um, as, as a lever for firms, um, because like it or not, firms are creating margin by offshoring and outsourcing mm-hmm. at a time where, you know, right now they've got room to, to move on fees, but maybe they haven't forever or won't forever. We've touched on the responsibility of the profession to be attractive to talent coming in. There's also a responsibility on firms to build their employer brand, to communicate that they are a great place to work. And uh, I do a fair amount of work outside the podcast because I interview so many people. I interview the staff that work at certain firms. They return me to retain me to tell their stories, interview their staff, create employee advocacy and say, look, our culture is real. And this is an employee talking about what it's like to work at this firm. And I ask them those questions, not getting a a big film crew in and making a big contrived corporate video, but these kind of like you and I are right now in a Zoom room virtually saying, why do you love working there? Why did you join? What was it like? How do people treat you? How have they invested in your career? And all these things that an accounting firm website traditionally would find it hard to differentiate between them and any of the competitors. So talk to us a bit about employer brand and what you see firms doing well to attract talent into their practice. Yeah, I think firms are really rethinking that and looking for every opportunity to do that because um, as we've talked about before, the supply of accounting students has has contracted significantly. So they're fighting much harder um, to get that top talent. Um, I'm seeing firms uh, do a couple of things. So first of all, they're connecting with talent much earlier in the process um, as a student begins their college career oftentimes, and they're staying in touch with them throughout that college career. So um, maybe the firm is offering an internship sophomore year of college, and you know maybe the student takes it, but then junior year they go to a different firm they're still staying connected so that they remain an option. Um, I'm also seeing firms be really supportive of students through the CPA licensure process. In the past, firms were expecting to hire somebody that was CPA ready, that had finished the 150 hours of education and all the other requirements. I I think firms are much more willing right now um, to help cover some of the costs and support somebody through that process. So all of these things are really uh, positive for the profession. What's really interesting to me that's emerging is firms are interested in not only supporting financially the coursework for licensure, but now even considering how do we reduce the workload in your first year of your career so that you have the time and space to go become licensed as a CPA. Um, I feel like that is another step down that path. 
um, where firms are being much more supportive of students going through that process. And I think that that will really impact the CPA pipeline coming into the profession. Mm, they're interesting insights. There's another element to that as you look further down the career path of mid-management, senior accountants, those strategic hires, those lateral hires, if you like, at partner level and, and directorial level, they are looking at their life recalibrating. Is this the life I want? Is this the work-life balance that I want? And firms, as well as being attracted to the younger generation, the new blood coming in, they have to put together an employer brand that is attractive to experienced professionals. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because you can do all of this work to, to build a pipeline and get people into the firms, but if you can't retain them, it's all for naught. Um, and so I, I, I think that there's a good and a bad to the pipeline discussion. One of the risks to all of this focus on pipeline is that I don't think firms are concentrating enough on the retention piece, as you're as you're alluding to there, they have to create a culture and a, and a firm that people want to stay at, because that um, historical kind of cachet that we're an incredible brand as a firm and people you know are lucky to be here, that's gone. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the sooner that firm leaders kind of adjust to that, the better off they are. Um, I, I'm seeing a lot of firm leaders really successfully navigate that transition. Um, and it starts with listening to people. So the work that you're describing, I think is really important because it, it provides a vehicle for firm leaders to listen to what's important, right? I know that the focus is on attracting uh, new talent into the firm, but it, it could be, I think, secretly a great tool uh, for a firm leader to understand what people want. Because right. like it or not, what that kind of middle tier of knowledge workers want and need from a firm is probably very, very different than um, what the firm leaders would have wanted or expected in their own career. So yeah. uh, definitely work-life balance is a part of that, but access to technology and, and accelerated career paths and many other things too. I was just about to ask you, what are the firms doing well that retain their best people? And you're alluding to it, listening well, providing great tech, providing a great working environment, having a culture that sustains any kind of work-life balance, those are all in the mix, aren't they? They are. And the, the, the one thing I would add to that list is that um, across the profession within firms and even outside of firms, the mid-career professional is going to have to reskill in a massive way. So the other thing that I think firms can and should do is support that reskilling because um, the things that even, even me as a mid-career professional that I learned in college and early in my career um, Technology has replaced all of that work. And so firms and companies have to support their professionals in some massive reskilling so that they feel prepared uh, and confident going into that future. Because the alternative is if they don't, uh, I, there's a big risk emerging right now that CPAs are going to look at the future and say, that's not a future for me. I'm going to go switch careers and move to a different industry. Yeah. Jen, this has been terrific. Just drawing it to a close now. I want to focus you to finish on the globalization of the workforce. As an example, the big four firms, we know that they take the cream of the graduates in most countries, but we're having situations now where big four firms, take the example of living in London, it's very expensive, but they can now recruit from anywhere in England or anywhere in the world and pay big four salaries for people that are living in much cheaper to live parts of the world, and it's really upsetting the whole talent remuneration benefits package dynamic and making it hard for the mid-tier firms to keep their talent and get new talent. Talk to us about how globalization is affecting the pipeline. Yes, uh, it is impacting it in a very big way. That's one of those changes from the pandemic that I think will remain um, and will never go back to where we were before. That dynamic that you just described, I'm seeing it play out here in Pennsylvania in the smallest communities in wow. the same way that you just described it in London in one of the largest cities in the world. Um, so even the 10 person CPA firm in a very rural part of Pennsylvania is dealing with that, where um, they don't locally have kind of the lifestyle elements that London has to attract or retain great talent. So even if somebody grows up in that area uh, and, and goes and gets a fantastic degree and has great experience, 
Um, in some ways, it's harder for them to attract and retain that talent because um, they have the opportunity to go work with with more, you know, global or um, larger organizations that might pay a higher wage. So I'm seeing that play out through the entire ecosystem. When I talk to firms that are smaller and unable to compete with the big four on salary, for example, um, my advice there is sort of think about what are the opportunities that you have or the competitive advantages that you have, because each firm has a different set of opportunities and competitive advantages. So for big four, it could be salary. It could be the opportunity to travel globally, interact with leaders of Fortune 500 companies, whatever that value proposition is. The smallest firm has a unique value proposition and needs to, to think about what that is and tell that story um, because it could be a very different element of work-life balance. It could be very early in your career, you accelerate your career path in a way that you would never get in big four. Um, you know, each, each piece of the ecosystem has a value proposition. Um, and so I think it's, a, it's being strategic in leveraging that. Yeah. Jen, you're so passionate. You're such a good advocate for the profession. What gives you the most hope for the next few years in the accounting profession's power to get on top of this talent pipeline and stay relevant and competitive? I think the thing that gives me the most hope as I look to the future are the students that I talk to. Um, each day when I get to talk to students uh, in accounting programs or business school students, um, they are so eager to come in and make a positive impact on our profession. And our profession is so ready for it uh, and so open to it. So that gives me the most hope. I think by and large, CPAs that run firms and companies want to be an innovative and transformative. And they're looking to that fresh talent coming in and saying, bring those skills, help us figure it out. And that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Jen Crider, CEO of the Pennsylvania Institute of CPAs. You've had all the answers today and all of the passion. We've really appreciated your company. Thank you for being with us. Rob, thanks so much for the opportunity. It was fun. <laughs>